Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of our problems okay. don't exist. Got it. True. Are we? Oh, You're well, on. hello, everyone. Welcome to Trail Talk. Boy, I'm glad you guys, I hopefully, <laughs> Um, you're able to see us without the wind interfering in some weird way. Man, it's blowing out there. Yeah, today. it sure interfered and, with me trying to get here. Yeah, today, baby. the wind's uh, definitely sweeping down the plains. I was yes. singing Oklahoma all the way. All here. the way. Yeah. Well, if you're going the right direction, the tr the journey's about like that. That's true. But if you're going oh, into, but the I tried wind. to go with the right direction. I was in Warica. Oh so, yeah, so, so hard. Bad, bad idea. Yeah. So uh, this is our guest today, Mr. Chris Deal. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Edie. I appreciate the invitation. Yeah, it's always great on. to see you. It's been a while since it, I've been on. It has been. Yeah, it has. Um, so, uh, well, welcome back. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, it looks beautiful out here. You need to come out to the Chisholm Trail Heritage Center and look at all the beautiful displays. Yes. This, this room here is particularly interesting. This is our uh, classroom where we'll bring the students when they come on a field trip. And our lesson right now is about the land runs. Fantastic. And so that's kind of, we kind of have it decorated a little bit to kind of focus on that. So yeah, Oklahoma has a rich and uh, diverse history, doesn't it? Absolutely, yeah. It's a very um, interesting, yeah, it's, um, it's messy. Yeah. That's one thing I've learned a lot uh, working here is history is so messy. Yes, well, and, and particularly in trying to get the actual story yes. of what occurred. So yes. many times, you know, history is, I always say, was written by the victors. So depending upon yeah. your perspective, I always like Oklahoma's history from uh, either First Nation perspective or immigrants' perspectives because it, you know, like we were, I was talking joking earlier, we, we actually are sitting in the state of Sequoia. Right. You know, right. we just didn't know when alfalfa bill got in there running the convention we ended up with one state taft and only approved one state so it's kind of an interesting thing it is you know uh yesterday we did uh we had a lesson about oklahoma governors i kind of started at the statehood governors i didn't do territorial governors yet so we did like five at a time and so yesterday it was 11 through 15. So that means that the time before when we had talked about alfalfa bill murray was one of those that we uh, had covered that that uh, six through ten. That was a very colorful group. It was of governors. several impeachments. Yeah, <laughs> uh, impeachments, impeachment attempts, Ku Klux Klan yeah. involvement, uh, Marlin mm -hmm. with the whole story with the Marlin mansion and the adopted daughter turned wife. Oh, I, I mean, woo, very colorful uh, and a little bit crazy. Anyway, eleven through fifteen. Johnston Murray, Alfalfa Bill's son, was one of the governors in that little yeah. group. And so we had a little uh, reflex, just many reflections. Well, I'm so on glad Alfalfa you're teaching Bill. history from that standpoint. You know, oftentimes history is taught in such a way it's rather boring. And people just think it's a bunch of dates. But really, you know, it's about the story of the people. And right. All, you know, it's yes. telling a story. And, uh, you know, you, you need to tell stories oftentimes. Everyone in their own way is a hero and they need a guide to tell the story of their mm -hmm. life. And that's really why I, I'm, I'm glad y'all are teaching history that way. Yes, I am too. And Ms. you know Andy, what? We are currently actually streaming live on our Jesse Chisholm page. We can continue and share the, the video to our page once it's over, or we can start over. Let's just keep rolling. Okay. Don't you think that'll be okay? Yeah, I think it'll be perfectly fine. Okay. Sorry for that little back and forth we just did, but you know we're just we're just keeping it real here. Um, so we, the wind actually blew us to a different. Page. The wind blew us to a different <laughs> Facebook page today. So <laughs> anyway, uh, I was I was just thinking, I have the pleasure of breaking history down into small segments and being able to focus on small amounts for like teachers have so much time constraint and they're so much they have to cram in oh, absolutely. you know and so it's it's fun to be able to research and do like just a small group you know five governors at a time sure that's so much more well and then you actually have a tangible experience for them we're all about experiences now whether it be right. retail or education and when they come here, like you have things on the wall here, Buffalo Soldiers, there's the yeah. Twin Territories, mm -hmm. but they can actually see visually 
uh, around others and have uh, interaction with stuff. So right, that's right, the beauty yeah. of, of your facility is the interactive component, mm -hmm. I think. Yes, absolutely. And we, we take full advantage of that. <laughs> it's very fun. We actually had a group from Texas this week from Bowie, Texas. Oh, really? Uh -huh, came up. And so we have, you know, a Chisholm Trail lesson. And so we just kind of adapted that and just focused on the Texas history part. And I was very impressed. They were third graders and they knew a lot about the cattle drives really? and everything. Yeah. And so I was really impressed that they knew so much about their Texas history. I thought that was super interesting. But enough about all that, Mr. Deal. Yes, ma'am. Uh, let's talk about the chamber oh, a the little chamber. bit. Yeah, well, the chamber, I'm very, I'd be very excited to talk to you about that. Okay, so first, <laughs> of like all, first of all, congratulations, award winner. The, let me, is it with the, the spirit? Well, they call it the Al Henshaw Community Spirit. Okay, Al Henshaw. Uh, if you may remember, Al Henshaw uh, was a mayor here in Duncan, but he also was probably one of Duncan's greatest advocates. He loved Duncan, he loved the people in Duncan. And so he had this certain spirit about him and he was kind of in the vein of Robert Kennedy who said, you know, he's not one of those that's why, he says, why not? Mm -hmm. And so he had this can-do attitude about him. And so he helped tackle many projects with others. And he was also, by the same token, very efficient. He was known to this day as having the shortest council meeting in history, I think it was like seven and a half minutes or something. Wow. But Al had this certain spirit and, uh, and and presence about him. I know when I first came to the chamber almost 12 years ago, Al, uh, outside of Sandy Stewart, Al was the very first person that greeted me. Uh, he was on the chamber board as an ex officio, and he made me feel welcome at the chamber. And then he would also give me pointers of individuals I needed to talk to or and he became kind of like my ears. He, mm -hmm. he would go to the Simmons Center like 5.30 in the morning, work out, come by the chamber, kind of give me an update. A little scuttlebutt. Well, you know, maybe. maybe you should think about this, Chris, mm -hmm. or, you mm -hmm. know, this is really kind of the way things work. And so he just had this also ability of building a network. And um, as uh, my friend Sandy Stewart of the same chamber would say, you know, seeing a need and meeting it. Mm -hmm. And so he just had this great spirit persona about him. And so to, to get an award named for Al, for me, it was, uh, first of all, a great honor. And secondly, I immediately wanted to pay tribute to him and, you know, really in a way accepted his name because he had such an influence on me and my uh, way that I address being a chamber president mm -hmm. um, and try to do that in a fashion I think Al would be proud of. Right. Right. Well, well deserved. Oh, thanks. I mean, I I, I have an obelisk now. I know, right? Yeah, yeah it's, it's big work. and kind of fancy looking. You <laughs> yeah, know, it really is. Uh, the, by the way, the chamber banquet was such a fun event. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I, it was it was very electric that evening. It very was fantastic. Von Hawk's Rising is a, a very talented band. I, I agree. And, you know, uh, when Sandy asked about the thought of having them, the, the part that really appealed to me as well is these, this group of individuals came together and they basically do all these concerts. So like that evening, we paid them to entertain us, mm -hmm. but those monies went into their fund to help uh, children have gone through traumatic experiences or maybe a traumatic illness help them and their families get through those types of things. So like the two uh, presentations, yes, the presentations they made that night. Exactly. Yeah. If you guys don't know about Von Hawks Rising, you should look them up. They play great. I mean, they are a rock and roll band. Yes, absolutely. So the comment we got, oh, they're loud, but they're so good. Oh, you know? yeah. I right. was like, you know what? I'm not going to be able to hear very well after this, but I love it. I did not care. It was so great. 80s rock. Man, and I asked man. them, and they did throw in, um, you know, with our audience, a very diverse group uh -huh. from many multi generational, uh -huh. to try to throw in something from the 60s through True. contemporary, True. yeah, just to so, so, oh, I know that song, mm -hmm. you know, to get some. And I, I saw people even that initially were like this, they were older, they were playing some song, and I was kind of seeing. Uh, a little bit of movement in the chair. Yeah, I um, was I was sincerely wishing that there was a dance floor. The young woman who sang with them. She's she, extraordinary too. And she sang Pat Benatar like 
it was Pat Benatar. I mean, <laughs> wow, it was it was awesome. But anyway, uh, there so there was great entertainment. Not to mention all the recognition of uh, all the people who just give so much to our community. Yes, and the the huge celebration of getting to have the banquet after not having it for now, 2019 was the two last years. Banquet, yes. So there were two years that <laughs> wasn't a banquet. And um, and these awards that we gave out were actually both awards that were voted on by the membership in early 2020 before the pandemic. Before, um, so the winners you saw that evening, including myself, were actually selected by the members mm -hmm. uh, prior to last banquet. Those were to be awarded on March 23rd, 2020. Uh, but then the pandemic hit, you know, right. when the Thunder game hit, everything began right, to shut yeah. down. And Rudy Gobert yes. hacking on the microphone and then the next day. <laughs> and so Oops. as a result, uh, 20 and 21, we know, uh, in fact, uh, Sandy Stewart and a uh, member of Bon Hawks Rising, uh, Jason Hawkins, he has uh, a studio, uh, Van Marshall Studios. Uh -huh. uh, that are a production company that done a lot of videos for Duncan. And so she contracted with Jason, who's a member of that band, okay. to do a video, which we tried to play that evening, but we were talking about technology. I right. uh, didn't get to play it, it was later posted. But in, in looking at that video, uh, what we were trying to do is demonstrate how, in spite of the pandemic, of kind of like a two year apocalypse, right. that there were so many acts of heroism. Uh, whether it be teachers or whether it be our nurses or in our nursing homes or you could just go down a list even families having to abbreviate their lives to take care of their children you know mm -hmm. so we felt like there in many ways heroic behavior and coming together was so demonstrative in our community we just recognized everybody right for their heroism right, in yeah. 20 and 2021 uh -huh. and so then for the next banquet next year we'll have uh, the awards go back to normal for 2022. Mm -hmm. But it was just, it was so, it would be so impossible, I mean, to not recognize people and these nominations come in from the membership. But what if you missed a story? There were so many, and that's what the video talks about. Yeah. There were just so many stories, uh, uh, you know, about whether the nursing home or mm -hmm. schools, homes, you know, businesses, what everyone was trying to do to come together mm -hmm. to persevere through this pandemic, through a, a round that almost felt like a surrealistic Salvador Dali painting. Right. Times, you know, uh, yeah. And just uh, the, I mean, the, the genuine feelings that people shared, you know, people didn't, um, I felt like that they were real. Mm -hmm. I thought, I felt like they were very real um, and open about, you know, the things that they were feeling and experiencing and, you know, how, how they got through. I, anyway, I thought it was a really great. Well, well done, very well done. Well, and at the chamber breakfast this morning, uh, Lois Stone and Nate Chef uh, were our MCs, and we brought up the fact that Sandy is also very good, not only at putting on banquets but keeping secrets. So some of the highlights of the evening had to be uh, when Emmy, Emily Callahan, mm -hmm. who, as you know, is the marketing director for St. Jude, is right. patting Floyd Weininger's mm -hmm. daughters. That was kept a secret by Sandy. Uh, Ms. Callahan came in and presented that award and that beautiful biography of her mother. Right. It was a great tribute. And, yeah. A great tribute. And uh, then I know when the man of the year, she kept all these tallies, but then also like with Chris Billings. So mm -hmm. there was actually the, he knew, he said later, he knew something maybe up because he's the head of uh, the, uh, I think Jeff Miller, the head yeah. of the aerospace and defense department was, <laughs> was sitting in there yeah. with him. Yeah. yeah. So, I uh, mean, Sandy's really good. So that was a joke this morning <laughs> that Sandy, if you have a secret to tell, you could tell the Sandy because it's almost a three-year secret. So, <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, but everything that evening and uh, the food, uh, the Simmons Center, the only thing, like I said, is we had the glitch with the video, which was posted mm -hmm. uh, later. Uh, I knew that it was going to be a great evening when Lee McIntyre, our chairman, not only did introductions that evening, she got up and sang yes you know, somewhere over the somewhere rainbow. over the rainbow and i knew that i was immediately in for emotional evening when i felt goosebumps form around my ankles mm -hmm. and begin to work up my legs and come out the back and then all of a sudden just spontaneously tears yes. started coming by she was doing as i understand it the barbara streisand version mm. and for whatever reason emotionally it was it just really captured me at that moment it was powerful and the theme was no place like home yes and um so uh anyway the just 
that song just kicked it off. Everything was beautiful, crowded. I mean, it was. oh my goodness, there were so many people. It was so fun. And like I mentioned, Kevin and I, th that was our first opportunity to I'm so glad attend. To and experience yes, that. yeah, it was great. I it think, uh, you know, Sandy and her committee can, can, you know, each year that they've we've had a banquet, uh, you know, it's definitely become the event, I think, to go to. Mm -hmm. and, and this was particularly poignant because of not having to have it for several mm -hmm. years. And then having that many people come together and celebrate our community and celebrate one another, mm -hmm. uh, I think a good time seemed to be had by all. I, actually, it's the first banquet that I personally haven't received a list of complaints. <laughs> You know, you know what? So, I bet people are just a lot, little more appreciative now well, of I'm those hoping. things that we didn't get to do. <laughs> that you know, I, the last few guests as I've been talking, um, I've kind of used a, a phrase. I've been referring to it as maybe post COVID. Post COVID. Yeah, yeah. and so I've I've been kind of using that as like a, a time frame <laughs> reference, hoping against all hope that that is what we're looking at now, you know, and that post COVID, we're going to be able to continue to move on kind of like we did before. Yes, pre COVID. Um, so I was thinking about about the banquet, you know, and about all of the, you know, two years without a banquet. Well, during those two years, a lot of things happened in our community. Oh, absolutely. And yes. lots so, of changes. a lot of changes. Uh, lots of innovation occurred in our community. True. Just look at you doing Trail Talk. Right. Yes, exactly. A way to, a to touch the audience, to, for them to experience being at the museum, but not being able to necessarily mm. be there. Right. Uh, that's a great challenge that you rose to through innovation, kind of like our retailers. I mean, mm -hmm. think about uh, right off the bat, uh, Brandy Rhodes at Rip Crib, and Tony Lopez uh, at uh, Don Jose and others, the new ways of, it, of getting their community, we're thinking the main street, all those merchants, on, mm -hmm. they didn't have drive-throughs or something, inventing pickup and all right. those kinds. So right. there was so much innovation there. And I can even remember going to the movie theater and getting movie popcorn and candy that I could take home yeah. <laughs> and watch so, and so we could watch a movie at home with all the fun part, you know, the fun food things that, yeah, I mean, yes, there were people thought of so many ways to try to be relevant. And through all of that, were, were the, the businesses able to maintain I mean, I was thinking about like, do after two years, did we lose some businesses? Did we gain some? Did were some just able to tough it out? I mean, what what did that kind of end up looking like, Chris? Well, surprisingly, I mean, we did have some uh, business closures during COVID, but we also had actually businesses opening, and we had uh, presences uh, changed. And if you were to look. Um, well, let's just take, for example, our, our fast casual dining, like at Chicken Express or mm -hmm. Otoko Casa, had to close their lobby area, mm -hmm. but they come up with programming on their drive throughs You know, people would come out and advance order you and different types of things. And their volume actually was larger during COVID when their mm -hmm. lobbies weren't open than they had been in 2019. Or if you look at the innovation of Brandy Rhodes uh, there at Rip Crib or go to Tony Lopez. So. Mm -hmm. Or if you look at our restaurant side, uh, a lot of innovation, even downtown Boomerang, you know, they come out to your curb, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. merchant other places. So uh, they actually, if you look now, because I work in retail some, right. uh, every Applebee's, every Rip Crip now that's being designed has a drive through. Uh, the pickups, if you look at the Sonics that are coming out, they look kind of like you dropped a, a prefab modular box in and then the drive through So now mm -hmm. it's a narrow lot, but it has to be 250 feet to accommodate those things. Right. So that's spilled over. When you look at the retail downtown or the retail, look at the innovation of RNS drug on the way she handled pick up and drop off mm -hmm. and coming out. Um, those things are, are staying to certain extents. If you go downtown, the merchants, you still, if you pull up to the curb and call them in, you know, I'm here to pick up my order. If you don't feel comfortable. Uh, also, we saw more, 
uh, embracing of um, you know Spotify in the community, different you mm -hmm. know GoDaddy websites, mm -hmm. uh, using different platforms. If someone didn't know how to build a website, you know there were individuals to help them. Like downtown uh, at the time, Destiny Allfinger, there's a Main Street vector did a lot of work in trying to make sure the downtown merchants understood what they needed to do in order to serve their community. Mm -hmm. So. You know, those businesses actually continue to do well, um, surprisingly to everyone. Uh, if you look at the sales tax numbers, we're up about 17% over last year and last year was over. But if you look at the, the 2020 numbers, probably compared to 2019, yes, we were down, depending on the sector, 15 to 20%, but that's a lot better than just a total oh, right. you know, drop yeah. off the cliff. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we had a few entities that just, no different than the chamber. A lot of people don't know the chamber that whenever you're the big problem we had initially was so many businesses were considered non-essential. Yeah. And the essential and non-essential definition, you know, during the executive order, the chamber from March to November, we spent time every day trying to navigate and having health department, Marcus McIntyre, our representative, and others in the mayor to explain what's going on. Mm -hmm. But it basically had how close a physical contact are you in in this business. So mm -hmm. even those. You can encourage traders to maybe do a private appointment, mm -hmm. maybe do different types of things. Yeah. Um, so really, there weren't as many businesses closed. In fact, innovation, the way it was occurring, we did see a lot of creation of businesses online or hybridized or continue on. And, and a lot of those, luckily, already had some presence on the Internet. If they didn't, they do now. Mm -hmm. And you saw a lot of things being on Facebook. Yeah, I mean, we stream lines of Facebook businesses. We're doing things live on Facebook, anything to engage. Mm -hmm. Lucky for us, uh, then in mid-May of 2020, so you were down a month and a half, yeah. you know, essential, non-essential. But on May 15th, we were allowed to open restaurants. And that's mm -hmm. when we did the first virtual ribbon cutting yeah. with everyone wearing a mask and distance at uh, Don Jose. Uh -huh. And... Uh, you know, he and other restaurants and then businesses as well downtown. They were steaming clothes after someone tried them. They were sanitizing everything. So I, I think really they, they pers persevered really well through the pandemic. I think everyone was proud of the innovation, but because of the innovation, they survived. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's about 2,500 businesses in the community and only there's only 400 members of the chamber. So a large portion of the business community is not a member of the chamber, but it doesn't mean I'm not trying to, to help. We're not trying to help as a chamber. And a lot of the people that were asking us questions or calling were not chamber members. And we were just trying to help everyone as a community mm -hmm. to get that information. Mm -hmm. um, the other part that helped, honestly, was our financial community. Uh, when the PPP program came through, the Paycheck Protection Program, right. Uh, and the later data also had an extension of some COVID dollars to help, uh, you know, stimulate not just, you know, industrial but retail. So those were actually godsends to many businesses in our community that they would tell you during that really six month period of March, six months into to September that they may or may not have made it. Right. Uh, but a lot of that had to do, you have to have personnel, you have to have payroll. Mm -hmm. But then if you've been told you're non-essential or you're having difficulty and a lot of people left retail during that period just to try to find another job because many of them for six weeks or more had no employment yeah. and that was the biggest yeah. challenge yeah and then trying to reactivate that but luckily the total closure was only a month and a half or two yeah you know, yeah that was that, yeah. that was the hardest period i think right uh, and it was the weirdest yeah it was absolutely but the even the chamber thing. with funds i mean we had to let people go uh, we almost had to close twice in 2020, once in 2021, and it, it basically is dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was the part I was so proud of. However, they managed to do it with their innovation or creativity. I think our business community actually emerged with many more tools that they're going to continue to use and help grow mm -hmm. our retail and service sectors in particular. Right. Just something you just said made me think of something. Um, the chamber is a nonprofit organization. Yeah, we're a five hundred one c six, which is okay. basically a trade association. Okay. And um, so we are just a um, trade association of members that mm -hmm. were. It was designed for people to come together to try to mobilize uh, 
resources in the community, sometimes those resources are kind of scarce. And so how do we uh, get the biggest bang for our buck as a business community? What do we work on? And oftentimes it boils down to building uh, its quality of life issues, right. uh, yeah. retail and economic development. But uh, oftentimes it's just getting people the tools they need to, to do well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's a volunteer member based organization. So all its funding, um, Oh, about 38% of the funds come from the dues. Okay. And then about 62% is event focused. And you know, when you can't have events, oh, you're yeah. not generating those dollars. So that was our cash flow difficulty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we did try some, uh, it go virtually as much as we could. Uh, but even at that, and we did have live outdoor events. We continue to have golf right. tournaments yeah. and things of that nature. Yeah. But it's pretty, um, you know, whenever you're shut down, and I think people in events, you know, you saw even here or at the Simmons Center or other places, when you're in an event driven facility, yes, uh, yeah. and you can't have human beings come in and have a human experience, right? Uh, it's <laughs> yeah. A, yeah, it's it's just a whole different. Yes, ma'am. It's it's very different, but um, okay, so uh, you know, you you talked about people getting out of retail, and then like. Was it like in November of last year where they had, they called it the great something where oh, the resignation? Great resignation. Yeah. Have, have we had, has that impacted Duncan, the great resignation to your knowledge? Well, in, in a certain respect, uh, the great resignation, uh, so many, uh, so many of those things they define uh, uh, oftentimes, on, even on unemployment, you know, right now the unemployment state's 2.8 and it's 3.6 in the nation, but we, have every a lot of people still that will tell you I don't have a job, and a lot of people tell you I need someone to come and work. Well, right? that number is based on receiving unemployment benefits, right? Well, yeah, the I've always found it intriguing. I think those numbers are actually <clears throat> created to have a narrative, a political narrative, more than anything else. So, right. Yeah. <clears throat> no different than if you want to know the money supply, you don't look at the M three, which is what we hear in the news all the time. You look right. at M six. So. I'll throw another one. Unemployment has many different statistics. You want to look at U6 levels, which tells you how many people actually have the potential to be employed that just are not seeking a job, how many people actually are underemployed, even though they're not counted as being employed. A lot of people in our community have vast skill sets, but they're not able to find jobs in those categories, or maybe the part of the resignation, I think they just come up with that byline nationwide is because this was an opportunity for employees I mean, this was an opportunity, and in fact, in the new, we don't even call it human resources anymore. You yeah. call it people resources. You right. call it, in other words, no different than we don't do planning of the community anymore based on a car or on just some grid. It's human-based planning. Mm -hmm. So humanity emerged itself as actually a player yeah. in the employment of people. Imagine that. Right? So, yeah. Uh, it's not all about the businesses. So as a anymore. friend of mine that's in consulting, Mike Kahn talks about people want and need <laughs> to be seen. Mm -hmm. So we were just seeing people that, you know, we had to shut down the country. If there was ever a time for me to go do something else, if there was ever a time for me to go into business for myself, it's the time is now. And so a lot of, even in our community, people that left employment somewhere else, I, a lot of jobs were created themselves. They yes. became very entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be through online engagement or consulting or freelance work. Um, so, and then the retail sector, unfortunately, is also one of the largest employers. If you look at the total employment in the United States, uh, outside of the entertainment industry, believe it or not, retail is the next one. It's not manufacturing, it's not any of those. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, they're very low paying jobs as far as a base wage. And so they're also dependent upon the benevolence of the people that are being served. Yeah. And so if you don't have people to serve, and then even if they ask you to come back, and they're still just going to pay you a certain fee. Mm -hmm. So it, it was just looked at as an opportunity that maybe to look at my skill set and move on. But also the great resignation, people my age, I'm an old guy. So what we saw in our community, a lot of people, whenever these things happen, they yeah. just took the opportunity to retire. Yeah, yeah. Um, I always get tickled there griping about the participation rate. But if you look at a state like Oklahoma that's aging, a lot of the people they're saying aren't participating is because they retired, right? Yeah, you know, they're, they're or maybe they're disabled, or yeah. maybe they're ill. So yeah. those numbers all the time, like I said, no different unemployment or monetary or inflation. A lot of those things 
um, are just things I think, you know, the politicians have some type of narrative. Mm -hmm. I always found it interesting until recently, inflation rates didn't even take into account food prices and gasoline prices because they're based on commodities, which tend to be extremely volatile. Mm -hmm. Now, this time in inflation, the narrative oh. is all about those two. Right, yeah. So I, I just think uh, the beauty of being like in our community is that we see people working together to try to lift one up. And we're trying to redefine what all this looks like as a community. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of need to give each other a little bit of grace as we go through this process. Now, everyone needs a job and everyone wants a job and everybody needs an employee. But maybe we should listen to each other more as to how to engage. Mm -hmm. You know, even generationally, sometimes if you uh, a lot of criticism, uh, I like millennials and the younger group, because I honestly think if you really look, a lot of people just look at their appearance or what they're doing. But if you actually look at their entrepreneurial spirit, the amount that they're in business on their own and their creativity. Mm -hmm. It's actually going to be the generation that figures out how to pay for the baby boom that retired with so many and how yeah. we're going to fund Social Security. Yeah. So I, by totally. that, yeah, by yeah. that token, a lot of times it's just a matter of like, I was talking about my con being seen. So I was consulting manufacturer and I couldn't get millennials to do this was about a year and a half before COVID. I said, do you understand that I'm a guy that if you told me you need 50 widgets out of me this day. I will stand at this machine and I'll produce those 50 widgets because that's what I was taught to do. Mm -hmm. My the classrooms, our seats were all in a row. There were 50 of us actually in the classroom at Irving. Uh, we, were, we were all Holy in a cow. row. We would be, hey, and all, but generationally elevated. things changed, yeah. right? Yes. Yes. And so they weren't having them stay and show up at work and show up at home. You realize they want to be part of something. They want to feel that their efforts mean something, that they as a human being mean something. So, so all you got to do is once you, every time you have there, when you have every once in a while, when you have one of those big machines come off the line, take them all out there, have a little celebratory explanation of here's what you all contribute to. And this machine, when it gets out into the world, this is what it's going to do. They're part of it. Exactly. You yeah. Know, and sometimes it's just those simple things like that. It's, yeah. You know, we have to. Just because they think differently doesn't mean they're yeah. thinking wrong. So I it think, doesn't mean it's yeah. wrong. So a lot of them quit working during this period of time, but it's just, you've got to figure out how to engage those and be more creative. And I also think that uh, 1099s are going to become uh, more prominent. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think people now, they spend time with their children and maybe they liked to spend time with children or maybe they liked uh, a certain amount of freedom. Mm -hmm. So a hybrid workplace, in order for us to be innovative. Mm -hmm. It's like I try to recruit call centers at different times. And what I come to understand, particularly right before COVID and during COVID, is if you look at platforms like Arise and Linebridge and stuff like that, that actually call centers exist now all over, but they're done by entrepreneurs like say you decided you wanted to put in a virtual call center and you go with this platform and you recruit people like me then to be under you. Mm -hmm. Well, you're self-employed. You're not in the workplace, according to some definitions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're an independent contractor, but those types of things, uh, you actually can have literally through those types of platforms, hundreds of jobs created in Oh, yeah. Uh, using those types of platforms. Easily. Uh, and those are non-standard. And, and just a few years ago, we didn't even think about it. Right. Well, you know, um, two of our kids uh, are, and they're they're married, and all the four of them have. Uh, careers that require them to be there. Mm -hmm. They have, you know, they have to go in. But to, the other two kids live in Washington, D.C., and virtual work, I mean, that's the majority of how they work now. Mm -hmm. They work from home. Or they can work, they can come home and visit and spend a week in Oklahoma and still get their work done. Yeah. And, and just that 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 whole idea, I mean. And that's why what you brought up the new economy, the way we solve a lot of this, is the communities like Duncan, we have to do everything we can to advocate for better fiber, for better yes, broadband. Yes. Because with facilities like the Chisholm Trail Heritage Center, the Simmons Center to the south, with the quality of life that the community is trying to build for people, then you have a destination that people want to live in because they can have a certain quality of life. Mm -hmm. Anymore, you can bring your job in many areas. Engineering, 
you know, or many of those engineers work, particularly if they're spatial design or things, they work remotely anyway. Mm -hmm. So you want to present your community in that vein where like your two children that are using a hybrid model for yeah. work. Someday they might like to move back to Duncan if we had the right assets and entertainment and nightlife and those kinds of things that draw people to the community. But you know, you need that broadband and that fiber at a level. Well, and, uh, to, and to not just that. not just for the employment sector, for the education, the education sector too. Right. I mean, Oklahoma <laughs> is way down on having yeah. accessibility our best speeds are still half a dollar yes you know. and and oh that was one thing during the pandemic you know there were just kids who did not have access to wi-fi right <laughs> what a what a devastating and so those thing. are those are you know as we reinvent our economy and we uh we engage those people that uh you know left work trying to come back to work it's even, uh, I ask you this, on economic development now, uh, you'll notice there's actually websites that track this. So one of the biggest attractors now for our younger age groups that come into your community that buy product, contribute to your mm -hmm. sales tax and stuff, communities now are actually incentivizing people with certain skill sets, entrepreneurs, creatives, artists, and others to move into their community and they're paying a stripe in for moving or expenses. Some are as low as a couple of thousand dollars, some are ten, fifteen thousand dollars. Tulsa's doing it in Oklahoma and other communities. And they're actually, they've done numbers. And so you're going to spend $36 million to throw at a company to try to get 200 people to come here. Yeah. And you have a very small chance, but monetarily they've run the numbers at Tulsa and, and not just here in other states. And the benefits of that, those people actually, when they come, they anchor, they bring their business, they bring the sales tax dollars for their sales and all that to your community. Um, they're actually having better luck with that as an economic tool than many others. So, Isn't that interesting? So that's also because of, you know, the talking about recognizing human beings for what mm -hmm. they're capable of and making an inviting place. Uh, you know, place making is the big thing, focus on humans, human resources now as people resources. So. We're starting to focus on people. Imagine that. I know. And I try know. to lift it's, people it's, up, connect people, yeah. network people uh, in the community. And I, I mean, I'm hoping that the end result of all of that is um, greater satisfaction. You know that that people do find that that level of satisfaction that they have desired in in their employment or careers or whatever. That maybe some of those things were missing, and you know, if you have an idea and you can come up with a way to make it into, you know, just this whole new career path, sure. how awesome. And then so many more tools are available mm -hmm. for people now. So, and, you know, um, even in our community, I was, uh, you know, I work in retail some and, and I've been told if I just could get a Chick-fil-A here today. Uh, right, you know, that's, have a halo. I've heard that for yeah, maybe as long what, as I've lived here. <laughs> so what I also want to try to express to people what you just said, educationally and picking what your walk of life or what you want to do, but also in your community, if you see a need in your community, we should have people coming together and say, you know, we really like that type of restaurant. We really like that type of business. Now, because of COVID, we're seeing all these big franchises now. They prefer to have someone from the community be mm -hmm. the franchisee mm -hmm. as part of the, if they don't have the, mm -hmm. the resources themselves as part of a group. Mm -hmm. uh, even the chefs and stuff like they're encouraged to give them like 10% equity in this facility because what they're wanting now, they, they don't want to fly by night. They're going to invest in your community, become part of your community, they're even going to design the inside to kind of be culturally a fit for your community. So they're encouraging now that in order, if you're a community like ours, that want to bring in stuff, mm -hmm. and you want these different types of quality of life things and retail things, then you need to work on building that capacity up within yourselves. Because you believe in yourself more than anyway, you believe in your community more than anyway, mm -hmm. what better people to have a stable franchise in a community than people from that community. So yes. that's the second you'll hear that with Chick-fil-A, Whataburger, uh, I can go down a long list. Yeah, all those, all those ones that people want. People want. Want here. You know, yeah, <laughs> IHOP is part of Applebee's. Uh, uh -huh. So, you know, in order for IHOP to come, 
Uh, you know, sometimes it's also our attitudes. When applicants came here, you know, it opened the same day as Pensacola, it was doing $110,000 a week in Pensacola. Uh, but yet it's hard to get certain things going, always in flow. But at some point, I think because we have an application, we might have luck having an IHOP, but we'd have even more luck if there was someone locally in the community that was interested in that. Yes. And professionally, uh, that's what I'm saying, since the retail sector was hurt probably more by COVID, um, that as it begins to rebuild more and more and all their innovation, I think as a community, we can come up with. If we want something, we should go after those sales. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Yeah, instead of waiting for them to come yeah. to us, we should pursue it. Yeah, and so that it's all about site selection now. So I'm really kind of annoying on some of them. I, I just kind of stand in front of them. I, uh, you know, I have a site selector. It surprised me actually coming in mid April for a few things. And they're done kind of like uh, they did, La Rogo does for right. the economic zone. And now retail, it's a site selector you deal with. And they decide if that's your community. Interesting. And then you can get the franchise to look at it. But if you already have someone in your community that's already doing that negotiation with the franchise, then it flips. And mm -hmm. then they're interested because these people are interested in them. And so it kind of makes it a different dimension. So when someone, this site selector comes here, mm -hmm. what are you going to show them? What are the, what are the high highlights of the community? Or are they just looking for a good place to put their well, oftentimes, unfortunately, for retail development, uh, immediately demographers and site selectors, which oftentimes had a background in real estate, obviously, uh, the elk and play, between elk and Plato and Highway 81 seems to always be where they look. They'll come into town, they'll see that actually there's not much land available yeah. in those locations. In yeah. fact, most of the land's taken, the rest of it are long term land leases. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think Robert Bell at Hells Elk. elk uh, Plaza Shopping, you know, recently he's brought in Cato and others, and right. if you look up by uh, Walmart, you know, recently. Uh, uh, That's where Cato is. Yeah, Cato, and yeah. Buddy's down at Del yeah, Plaza. But, yeah. And then uh, Luis Almarez uh, did a work with the city, and they did a lot of split, and Harbor Freight actually bought mm -hmm. that particular oh, really? site and said the lease, they broke it out. But most generally, they want a place that they can buy develop and then sell that to where you can get cash back and go to another restaurant. Uh, so so then your second tier of, of retail development is from elder to elk. Mm -hmm. And so I have a problem with that second tier because when I bring a site selector and they see the vacant Chisholm Suites Hotel. Yeah. Which has a chilling effect. Now we have Harbor Freight and we've had some renovation at 81 uh, mall there that's nice mm -hmm. stuff. You've got mm -hmm. Oak Tree. You have some good retail as an anchor, and they eat it around Chisholm Suites, you know, with Walgreens and mm -hmm. others. It's it's difficult though still because it's this, you know, there's a vacant hotel there. So that's something we have to work on. Uh, um, but usually, I try to, to capture them and show them other areas that are actually not showing on their traffic counts. For example, if you go by the fairgrounds. Mm -hmm. That's the second highest tra uh, traffic count in our town. So I have one site selector in that's specifically coming in to look at the south end of town because I told him what the traffic counts were, though. So he looked them up. I showed him the assets. I showed him how there's been a lot of investment down there. Mm -hmm. That actually there's land available. It's just not between uh, Elk and Plato right. anymore. And, you know, we, we have to also look at... Um, you know, the availability at the Elk uh, and the bypass. And we, I call it Highway 7 Connector, but yeah, anyone yeah. at the Elk Bypass, mm -hmm. the southeast corner there, that has a lot of opportunity. Uh, south part of town, then also the Second Street Corridor, you've got, so if, if you can paint a picture and present your community, nothing would make me happier than to even have a chain of some sort come downtown to help right. the revitalization process right. there. So I look at it a little differently. Mm -hmm. and push back against but they always initially they want to see something between elk and plato on 81. it's just not and so yeah there and so it's if they cool. if they'll do a lease then you try to get them in contact with uh, people that have the lease whether it's elk plaza or in you know, walmart or the outlots out front which where taco casa is uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, but a lot of times the lands that are available there are some land 
But now we're talking about needing 250 foot of depth of property. So sometimes we have a, a square piece of property that's about an acre, but it maybe doesn't have the depth to double stacking dot drives or which is what we're all in up with. It's at the yeah. So, but you know, I'm, I think Duncan presents it well, and I don't particularly try to direct them anywhere. I just try to think about what they're doing. And then you can drop a pin on a location see just you can if you have a public library card go to a to z database okay yeah and you can look up that's what i use i don't do and, and u.s census mm -hmm. and you can drop a pin and draw a mile and a half radius around it and you can see how many disposable income how much disposable income how many houses how many people live there so yeah, you also look at place around here possible right. retail development you'd be surprised uh, Dr. Miller's True North, mm -hmm. that particular intersection, you'd be surprised 1,200 uh, families around that area that have income to spend, the hospitals right there. So I'm, I try to present a broader spectrum. They're, they're focused on one area, and then but when I get a hold of them, then I try to right. pull that out and show them there are, depending on what your niche is. Mm -hmm. So like if you um, say Jersey Mike's, Jersey Mike's would be great and by Dr. Shea Miller's office mm -hmm. because of the hospital and because of what they serve and the kind of food they serve. You know, the, so depending on uh, the franchise who we're working with, when McAllister's, Panda Express, and others, so I was working and looking at COVID kind of got in the way, economy got mm -hmm. in the way, but they'll, they'll be looking back again. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. but they, they really are looking at traffic volume mm -hmm. and retail clusters mm -hmm. and you have to you know just think about it if you go to say robinson and norman 82nd street and log and second street and log you go you see a clustering of retail you know usually you'll see you know alta next to big sporting goods and yeah. a holes and a bed bath or right. you yeah. might see a marshall's next to a mardell's next mm -hmm. to a uh, old Navy, mm -hmm. those are co-tenants. Mm -hmm. So that's where you're really, if you want to really mm -hmm. grow your community, you get it, you find a developer that has these co-tenants and you find a location like Elk and Highway 7 or 81 Bypass and mm -hmm. you drop all of them in that one spot. Yeah, And that's what we really need. We don't have the potential of that because we're kind of just yeah. spotty on what's available. Mm -hmm. But I think as time goes on, continue to grow and start seeing some of that too. Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of like, I see a lot of, um, like, like Elk Plaza, as far as, you know, a big chain kind of place, those are, those are more like locally owned. Yes. Uh, we uh, have really a great ability to support unique boutiques. Yes, and unique yes. And I love that. Yeah. And you don't want to spend it in the past, you know, when I talked to the Lowe's and others, you know, you don't want to bring people in that are going to diminish yeah. that, which I think is a gem that we're able, if you look at, I mean, Lawton can't support, like, our Main Street with all the unique boutiques, or mm -hmm. if you point out El Plaza, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, so what you want to do to try to complement them is, like, Robert Bell that has that, there's availability to put out lots. Mm -hmm. So really, you know, the driver of those restaurant chains or other types of chains that drive traffic to purchase retail like right. that. Right. Uh, you know, at different times, part of the thing we have is land costs for fire or having long-term leases. That's probably, so, you know, you've had all these groups and other people in our community, mm -hmm. but you can't spend so much on property that it affects the you know, there's what well, they have four plans for. We have to run this much volume, and so it's basically sure. a low profit. For example, on a grocery, okay. uh, it has to be a high volume, low profit. Got it. So you can't spend so much on land leases and land that you'll never overcome that. Yeah. And, uh, we've seen a little bit of that in the community. Just a property comes up, you'd like to have that as a retail, and then it sells, and you don't blame the person for selling that land at that price instead of putting your restaurant in it because the profit they made on that land sale, it take them five to seven years to make that much profit on the actual restaurants. So yeah. Um, yeah, I mean there there is a lot to say. And especially uh because I think COVID put helped I don't know if helped is the right word, but um a lot of people found out, you know what, I'm not very prepared for something like this to happen. 
And so money in the hand would could be more valuable. It could, you know, really give you more uh, uh, the, just the ability to handle a situation like that much better. And, you know, uh, uh, everyone knew, knows that people have lived paycheck to paycheck for ever. Sure. But I I'm guilty. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, you know, but nobody, I don't think, not very many people really thought about what happens if the paycheck stops. Right. You know, and just literally, and there's no foreseeable time for that paycheck to start back up. Um, anyway, I think it maybe gave people a different view of um, personal finances and thinking about business and, and things like that. That's, you know, I think that's very true. And I, I think uh, regardless, good or bad, or whether whatever we think about the incentivization that many of us received during the coronavirus, whether it was a CARES Act check that's sure, 1200 yeah. piece or whatever, uh, or, you know, the expansion of social services programs, you know, mm -hmm. all those things will ultimately, you know, constrict and go away. But I think your point is that we've learned a valuable lesson in that uh, when all those things go away, I mean, the employment situation will change. Inflation is now a big player. I mean, a lot of the extra revenues we see are simply inflationary. Right. Uh, so right. even though your revenues are greater, even in the state coffers, doesn't necessarily mean you're any better than you were because they're inflated dollars, but you have inflated costs. Now. Yes. Yeah. So now we're also walking that. And I'm old enough to remember the 70s with hyperinflation. I don't know if uh, there's many people that actually I, remember. I mean, so. I, I try to tell my kids, you know, these, these things are pretty cyclical. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's presidents come and presidents go. You know, yeah. the, the Washington, D.C., they come and they go. Inflation goes up, inflation goes down. Housing costs go crazy. Housing costs come down. Yeah. There are too many houses in the market. There aren't enough houses. And I mean, it's just, it, it's yeah, just. Yeah, it's a 50-year-long it cycle, you know, depending yeah. on how you look at it. Yeah. I remember 50 years ago, uh, almost the same repeat when I was 50 years ago, we had a pandemic, not as large as we had a pandemic. We had a hot war. We had a currency war. We had a trade war. We had hyperinflation. All those things began like we're beginning this mm -hmm. 50 year. And then if you go back 100 years uh, to the 20s. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there's always those boom periods. Look at the, exactly. You know, so I, I just think that as a community, what we have to think of ourselves, just like you've created a beautiful experience here. This is almost like an enclave. It's like, you know, a jewel here. You can mm -hmm. come and experience things. So in a way, what Duncan needs to understand is that we have the ability to use a city-state model here mm -hmm. to where we actually lift one another up. We take care of one another. We actually can make, I mean, Duncan can, can make trade deals. You see businesses in our community making trade deals with other countries, with other companies, with other right. states. Right. Um, we have the ability to connect ourselves in the way we choose, but mainly we have the ability to build our economy here in the way to benefit our culture, our diverse, diversity mm -hmm. and our nature in mm -hmm. such a way to not be dependent on these cycles as much. We actually have that opportunity. I think the city state model is coming back mm -hmm. in many respects and less dependence than on the, the nation state and states in general. I uh, think communities that begin to look to themselves for their own answers in the future will actually find themselves better prepared for any of these things that come along. Right. And that's, I think, our big challenge. Mm -hmm. We always tend to wait on what the state narrative is or the national narrative. When there are so many great people in our community with such intellects and such creativity and such entrepreneurism that I honestly believe that Duncan has the capacity. I think it's proven itself, I think, where it is now. And it's shown this to be its quality. But now is the opportunity to actually to amplify that mm -hmm. and really move forward with it. Well, we've always had our own little... Uh you know, uh, local um, crazy roller coaster ride with Halliburton. Sure. And they've, they've always, I mean, their, their cycles are attached to other, you know, far reaching, but here in Duncan, it's, you know, 
they are hiring, they're yep. they're laying off, hiring, laying off, yep. and and everyone has learned to endure mm -hmm. and to um, just push forward and and sure. make it work and make our market larger than our community. Yeah. You've got I, I'm probably being too conservative, but I know of five businesses downtown Duncan that sell eighty percent of their product to people that aren't from Duncan. Mm -hmm. They're shipping it all over, everywhere, mm -hmm. the world even. And if you think about our sales tax revenue, if you really look at it, 60% uh, of those sales tax dollars for people coming into our community, there's a reason they're doing that. Maybe we need to focus on that mm -hmm. more. Right. But think about it. I mean, people are getting tickled. You know, they'll talk. The city is relying on sales tax revenue. Yeah. And then when someone has a complaint about them, so I'll pay tax. No, really, 60% of those are paid by someone that don't even live in your community. Right, yeah. So if we continue to think about that and ask about it, we've got people doing business all over the world. Like I said, 80% of their sales are not here. Mm -hmm. The sales tax dollars are here. Yeah, exactly. And Terry so, Knox was here oh, uh, yeah, weeks straight. ago, you know, well, she's and, so and she was just talking about these events, you know, mm -hmm. where we have a lot of these great events and the whole, the the best event, the one you really want to have is that multi-day event that brings people Absolutely. here and they they just pour money into our economy and then they leave. Mm -hmm. And so that means they're not consuming all of the benefits that that cash flow left with us. Right. And just what a what a great thing that is for the community. And so, yeah, I mean. Yeah, who would have thought that thought things that? like tourism would be one of your big players? I mean, we still have agriculture and oil and gas yes, at yeah. high level, but you've got tourism is a big thing here. Think about the future of entertainment. This is really, this area here is a gathering place, mm -hmm. but also entertainment. Uh, think about the fact, who would have thought that now aerospace and aeronautics, even in True. Duncan, True. is, you know, number two, mm -hmm. approaching number one. Right. I mean, you know, so as we continue to evolve, like I said, we have the capacity as a community. What I would love is for us to continue to work like we have been for many years of. Uh, people that, like you and others, they want their community to be that to where their children and grandchildren, when the decision makes of after they graduate or they get their training, where am I going to go? Where would I like to live? Mm -hmm. Where would I like? I want it, I want them to say I'd like to go home. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So yeah. Well, fingers crossed. Yeah, <laughs> fingers crossed. I think I talked to your office. Oh for no. Chris, thank me. you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I always like to talk to you. I mean, you have a lot of knowledge, but you also have a great heart for our community. And so I, I just really see you as a man of, who applies what he knows, is always learning more to to make Duncan better. And I you, think that's what we all want. Really. Well, yeah, yeah but, but thank you. Yes, you're the thank guest you who much. gets the praise today for that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. yeah, well, thanks for joining us. It's um, a great pleasure anytime. Okay. Uh, you know, if you, Anytime you uh, need to fill in or mm -hmm. whatever. All right, because I know right. you, Chris can talk about a lot more than just the chamber, even though that's that's number one job. You do a lot of other things in the community. So uh, I yeah. probably will have you back on. We, yeah. There's a lot of things that, uh, when is the, our, uh, the big fundraiser for the Food for Kids? The big fundraiser for the Food for Kids is actually August the 12th. But already okay. uh, Sandy's putting together committee meetings uh, later this month. Okay. Uh, we okay. have a golf tournament May the 8th. Uh, uh, we're going to go for the live. Chamber? Yeah. Okay. Uh, May the 6th, Friday, May the 6th. We also have, uh, we're going to go live breakfast again. Working with the Simmons Center, our earliest date to have a live breakfast is June. So we're going to have June 2nd, it's going to be a prayer breakfast. July 7th, we're going to start live in-person breakfasts again. Nice. Um, so those are those are things that uh, mm -hmm. are coming down. Mm -hmm. um, so I was we're just really thinking, excited about. Yeah, I know. I was just thinking about that'd be a great time to have you on before the banquet mm -hmm. to really promote. Well, and another thing you might uh, later in the summer too promote the food for kids, but the Chickasaw Nation actually had selected Duncan as one of 10 nation, uh, 10 communities within their nation to do a placemaking initiative with people for public spaces. And today I was working on that with Terry Knox, mm -hmm. Nate Shad, and also their their team that the Chickasaw is working with the if you look at the you look at people for public spaces, PBS.org, you get an idea of placemaking. It's human-based planning like I was kind of talking about right. earlier. Right. 
And so we're going to actually look at all different kinds of assets. And initially, we'll you kind of do the petunia approach. You find an area where there's a lot of human interaction, a lot of things going on. Um, and then you try to do things to make that more attractive, more of attraction. It's kind of a tourism driven thing, but it also demonstrates the Chickasaw Nation is really interested and invested in Duncan. Mm -hmm. So I'll be interested to know once I see, you know, these are professional planners right. that have the new urbanism as their focus uh, and what they see in our community and the potential in certain areas. Because, you know, if we make a place people love to live mm -hmm. and that have good quality of life, then, you know, their children and grandchildren will come back here. Mm, definitely. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're, I can think of all kinds of reasons yes. for Chris to come back yeah, and well, see us. Me, so, I guess I was trying to give you one. Yeah, yeah. there you did. You sure did. So, um, yeah, uh, well, uh, a lady from the Chickasaw Cultural Center is going to be on Trail Talk in a couple of weeks. That's fantastic. And talk about that and some things about the Chickasaw Nation. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. So um, anyway, speaking of events, yes, Saturday. Oh yes, Cowboys Saturday, and Cobbler. Saturday, yeah, Cowboys and Cobblers. Yes, come out and have your cobbler. Yeah, you can have your, you can have some cobbler. You can have some ice cream on that cobbler. You can hear some cowboy poetry That's and some fun. live music. Yeah, it's going to be fun. We're going to have artists with their um, uh, pieces here. Now, how many years have you guys been doing Cowboys? Right? This is only our second. Is it your second? Mm -hmm. Okay. This is the second one. We had one planned for 2020. That's what I'm We had these super cool uh, rolling pins that were all <laughs> like, had like kind of had a it, like a one of those printer things. Yeah. Been, anyway, they were amazing and they also 2020 on them. I see. And we didn't get to have it. So, we uh, had one last year and it was just kind of an intro. And so this year we're, we have some prizes and things like that for it. So anyway, we're excited. We're hoping it's going to catch on. It's a nice little, you know, springtime. Well, I don't think you were the only one abbreviated on the 2020. Uh, yeah. So the 2020 <laughs> for vision. Sure. <laughs> I was the talking. The 20s or all those kinds of things. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember. The Cowboys and Cobblers. So what Cowboys time do we Cobblers come out? Cowboys and Cobblers, one to four. One to four one on Saturday. One to four on Saturday, yeah. Come that here. sounds fun. Everybody come out and have some Cobbler yeah, and listen to the free, Cowboys. And it's free admission to the okay. Heritage Center all day. So it'll be a good time. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, so you guys come and join us and uh, come to sign off. So we say okay. happy trails. You ready? Yes. Okay. We'll see you guys next time. Happy, happy trails. trails.